everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, it's great to see such a great turnout uh, for such a good uh, cause. Uh, and welcome to what is hopefully the first of many uh, lively and uh, uh, productive discussions on issues of constitutional liberties and freedoms. Uh, both economic and civil liberties are, are the kinds of things we're going to want to talk about over the course of uh, hopefully the next couple years. Um, so um, without further ado, I would just like to briefly uh, introduce Dr. Benjamin Powell, our, uh, our special guest speaker today. He's the director of the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech, uh, which is new to Texas Tech, I believe, of this year. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. And uh, so he's going to gives a, a presentation and afterward we'll be able to uh, ask questions and just have an open discussion. So I'd, I'd encourage everybody uh, to ask questions and make comments uh, and clear up anything you might, you might have questions on. Uh, that's, that's really the main purpose of what we're doing here today. Um, and that's just to sort of have an open, open discussion, town hall style meeting. And um, so I will not blather on for much longer. Amanda, did you have anything? To add? Yeah, I just have a few things I wanted to add. Um, if anybody has any topics that they're interested in or they think that is relevant to our liberty, uh, I think that you can email us at lubbockliberty at gmail.com. It's just lubbockliberty at gmail.com. And if you know of a guest speaker, that would be good. Um, somebody that you've had in contact that is an expert on a subject that you think is important to our civil liberties, then just email us there. So that's, I think that's all I wanted to say, but yeah, just take that email down and let us know if you've got any ideas. Yeah, and again, this is a- Liberty at gmail.com. Yeah, this is something that uh, Amanda, Mallory and I have organized, and so it's, it's a very informal organization, and so if you would like to get involved and help us organize and plan these things, uh, you're more than welcome just get in contact with us and uh, we're more than uh, happy to have have some more help so uh, without further ado uh, Dr. Benjamin Powell. Great, thank you. All right, well <clears throat> thank you um, uh, Brian and Amanda for setting this up. I think it's great that you guys are all going to have a, a monthly, monthly uh, Liberty workshop uh, and I look forward to participating in it more, coming uh, and sitting in on other talks that you host. Uh, I'm new to Lubbock here. I've only been here since January. Uh, in fact, I have my family with me today. This is the first time my little boy Ray's probably seen me give a talk. Um, but that's very my wife Lisa who moved down here with me in January to get the new Free Market Institute started at Texas Tech. Uh, and also I should say Chuck Long is two seats down from there. He works for me at the Free Market Institute. Um, and what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the decline of economic freedom in the United States, what the implications of that are, and then introduce you hopefully to the Free Market Institute and the type of stuff that we're going to be doing there, because uh, I'd like you all to be coming and taking advantage of our events and stuff that we put on for public programming through that as well. So one of the things I'm doing with this is getting out and meeting people in the community, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to meet all of you this morning and introduce you to the, the Free Market Institute. Uh, I should say I'm happy to take questions as I'm going in here, but I'll also leave plenty of time for discussion at the end of it. It's, I can kind of roll however you guys, however you guys want to do it. Um, so they asked me to talk about kind of uh, issues related to the United States now and monetary policy and other things, and we can get into specifics on some of that if you guys want in questions. I'm going to try to keep it more general to start uh, in talking about kind of the overall environment of economic freedom in the United States. And it's also not an accident because that's really why this institute got started here at Texas Tech. Uh, it was a, a West Texas uh, cattle rancher who was uh, sitting around talking with one of his friends and he says, you know, the world's really going in the wrong direction here, particularly the United States the last 10 years. He says, our freedoms are declining. And he says, and worse yet, kids don't understand how the free enterprise system works and how economic freedom can benefit us. Uh, and his buddy said, well, you know, maybe we should do something about that. And he said, okay, well, this is what do you want to do? Do you want to start a lecture series? He said, well, maybe, you know, like a talk. And he said, well, let's start a whole institute. Uh, and then they shopped around to some different universities talking to him, and it was the entrepreneurial leadership at Texas Tech. We said, well, let's do it here. Uh, so that's what got it started, is really this kind of demise of freedoms that we're seeing in the United States. And the idea for the institute is to help combat the ideas that are underpinning this decline. Uh, so economic freedom, we kind of, you know, in its most basic sense, it just means buying, and it's the freedom to buy and abstain from buying uh, on your own wishes. Uh, 
how we quantify that and measure that uh, is a little bit difficult, but since the mid-90s, economists have been doing this. Uh, they've created what's called an index of economic freedom, where it kind of measures our freedom across different areas. And this is economic freedom, so you mentioned like civil freedoms and stuff. This is not addressing that. This is just your economic one. So broadly, it's in five different kind of categories. So size of government, how much the government taxes and spends, uh, legal structure and property rights, how secure are your property rights, uh, how uh, trustworthy are the courts. Uh, access to sound money, so basically low, low rates of inflation, stable monetary unit, or the ability to at least get out of your currency and get into another one so that you can use such a, a stable currency. Freedom to trade internationally, uh, so basically low tariffs, quotas, other barriers to trade and such. And then regulation, how much do they regulate credit markets, labor markets, or businesses. Uh, so these are kind of the five broad areas. There's about 40 different measures that go into these things, but across these five areas, that gets a kind of general sense of economic freedom. Because it's one thing to be like, oh, well, that's a, you know, you know, people like to say socialist Sweden or something like that. Well, Sweden does have a big welfare state. They spend a lot of money on transfers. And they regulate labor markets quite a bit. But actually, when you look across the board on different things, it's not socialist Sweden at all. In fact, that's why they do relatively well. They've got really good security of property rights, really good freedom to trade, uh, pretty sound money, and it's just a couple areas that they deviate. So what this gives us is a kind of broader picture instead of just, oh, that government spends a lot of money, this one doesn't. It's, this is more comprehensive of how much does it intrude on your life, uh, on your economic life in various ways. Um, so this is kind of a snapshot in a picture of economic freedom around the world today. Uh, uh, not coincidentally, red is bad, uh, so that's the commies. Uh, Blue is the best, the most free countries, the most uh, free quartile, uh, which the United States happily still is within. Um, the grays on the map in there uh, are unranked, which you can kind of extrapolate from that what it would be if it could be ranked, because this is all based on availability of data and ability to measure this stuff. Uh, so, you know, your North Koreas and Cubas of the world are unranked because you can't even get reliable information out of them. Um, but they'd probably come in there as reds. Uh, So, why is this important? This is probably like a really easy audience to talk to this stuff about. Is as you're more economically free, basically anything that you care about, you get more of. Uh, so, whether we look at incomes, life expectancies, child, uh, infant mortality rates, uh, basically literacy, anything you care about, uh, generally we find freer countries do better than less free countries. Uh, and sometimes the differences are striking. So, this here is just in economic freedom and income. The most free countries have incomes around $40,000, while the least free are sitting around $4,000. Uh, dramatic differences in incomes. Also differences in growth. Uh, more free countries tend to grow faster than less free countries. Uh, so over time, since no accent, these lines are kind of closer together, right? Over time, you separate out as one country's growing at four or five percent and other countries are growing, well, at zero or negative percent in some cases. Um, this actually kind of understates the importance of economic freedom in terms of changes of our well-being. Uh, in more, instead of just graphs like this, in more sophisticated st uh, statistical work, basically what economists have sorted out on this is levels of freedom matter. So the freer you are, the more you grow. But even more important than that is changes in freedom. So as a country becomes more free, even if in an absolute sense you're down here in some of the, well, there, in some of the least free countries, uh, if you're making improvements, you can have big increases in your growth rates. And I think kind of like the intuition on that is like a normal country and, uh, with a private enterprise system, you know, the, the joke among economists, right, is that there's a senior economist and a graduate student walking down this, the street. This is an economist joke, so it's not gonna be very funny, by the way. Uh, and, uh, as they're going down the street, the, the young guy says, oh, look, there's a $100 bill on the sidewalk. And the older economist says, no, there's not. If it was there, it would have already been picked up. So the idea that the market's already equilibrated and basically grasped your profit opportunities. But there is something to this. While there are $100 bills on the sidewalk, they don't tend to persist. So in a healthy economy, every time there's a profitable opportunity, entrepreneurs are there to seize it and take advantage of it. But you could think of like a repressed economy of like walking down that same sidewalk and instead there being like a metal grate above the sidewalk. So there's these $100 bills that are popping up on the sidewalk, but like no one can reach down and grab them. So they all just kind of accumulate. Then a change in economic freedom is like dropping that grade and all of a sudden a bunch of hundred dollar bills that have been stacking up are there to grab. So entrepreneurs are like doing a cluster of activity which gets your measured growth to shoot up. 
so that's like partly what you see going on in places like Ch so China's kind of a mixed bag, by the way. But part of what you see in China is while they still have a low level of freedom, they're in the uh, third group of this index. Uh, their improvement has been massive. They're the biggest improver in Asia uh, since 1980 in economic freedom. As a result, they're getting a big upshoot in growth. Some of their growth is also probably faked, fueled by monetary policy and other government interventions there. But a large chunk of it is real. I mean, the amount of poverty reduction that's happened in the last decade in China is greater than at any other time in human history in terms of absolute numbers of people. So there is something real about it. And the story is a big increase of economic freedom. Of course, when you're coming out of you know, cultural revolution and great leap backwards. Uh, <laughs> you got a lot, long way to improve. Uh, but that's partly what you're seeing there. And also India too. India is again would be towards the bottom of the index, but since 1991 they've had about a 30% improvement in terms of their economic freedom. It's no accident that that's the start of it because they had a crisis there, a foreign exchange crisis where uh, they were worried about an I Perversely, the one way that the IMF tends to promote development in the world is countries that are so afraid of having an IMF intervention reform themselves so that they don't get the IMF bailout. Uh, India is one case of that. Ireland is another case in the 1980s that did something similar. Uh, but the result, anyway, is about a 30% improvement in economic freedom in India. Uh, in India's case, it's uh, sectoral, though. So, like the IT sector, international trade, that stuff is relatively free. A lot of traditional areas in the Indian economy remain repressed. So people who work in agriculture or a small scale business, a lot of that's still highly regulated and masses of people stagnate there where other areas are growing. China, it's not across industries so much as regions. If you break up China, uh, so this index actually dramatically understates how free some parts of China are because it's looking at a national level. Uh, if you look at coastal zones in China in particular, they tend to be much more market orientated. As you go towards the interior, it's much less free. Uh, yeah. Sure, no problem. Uh, I don't know if I can give it a general, I don't think I have a generalized answer to that. So, um, in fact, actually, one project I have set up for this Free Market Institute, I've got a big grant in with the um, Templeton Foundation from Sir John Templeton Mutual Funds, and the, the research question attached to it is, what causes economic freedom? So what I'm going to talk about today is a lot of the benefits of economic freedoms. We know a whole lot less about the process of transition of how you go from less free to more free. Um, I meant... Is, has there been some erosion in those, those non-freedom yeah. yeah, so I definitely agree that ultimately it has to be a political equilibrium that changes in order to give you more freedom. It doesn't have to be a particular political system, so the second most free country in the world doesn't have democracy. The second most economically free country in the world doesn't have democracy, Singapore. Um, General impression actually is when you look from like dictatorships to democracies, uh, their level of growth doesn't vary on average too much across them, their variance does. So dictatorships when they want to give freedoms can do it easily and grow rapidly, but they can also kill large chunks of their citizens. Uh, democracies are harder to move in either direction it seems. But then the question is what is the impetus for that move? Part of it I think clearly is a worldwide ideological shift from 1980 to 2000. Part of that we're seeing reverse itself over the last decade now, and that's what's going to come through in the index. But the overall story of worldwide economic freedoms improved greatly since 1980. Obviously, the fall of communism in the in Russia and Soviet Union is a huge part of that. But independent of that, the RNE Western democracies that were more capitalist have also become more economically free over this time. In some cases, it's clear that there was like ideological and political movements. In other cases, it's just pragmatic responses to economic situations. So like the big contrast there would be, be like the, you know, Margaret Thatcher just died, the Thatcher Revolution in England, where it was clearly, well, there were economic forces that had stagnated that economy to a, a stage where it was ripe for a reform, but there was like an ideological movement behind Margaret Thatcher that got in there. Ireland at the same time in 1986, there's no ideological revolution at all, but they actually make much bigger improvements in economic freedom because they had unsustainable government debt and were looking at a bailout and their only way out of it was chopping spending. So actually when you look at them, they went from uh, the government consuming about 55% of the entire worth of the economy in 1985 
to down to taking 33% by the mid-1990s. I mean, in terms of, I mean, 33%, that's, don't get me wrong, it's still 33% too much as far as I'm concerned. But <laughs> in terms of like real changes, that's like a massive change there. And the prime minister who was doing it in the late 1980s is the same guy who was a big spender in the late 1970s. So there was no ideological shift there. So I think each case is its own, well, the research grant that I propose is to try to figure out what are the similarities across these, are there general lessons we can learn right now. I don't have good answers for you, and actually I just don't think social scientists in general have good answers for that. I think it's one of the most important questions that we have the worst answers to. Um, and that's not necessarily just an economic research project, then it's an economic one, it's a political science one, it's a sociological one, there's lots of factors that can go into it. Um, so great question, I have no answer, but I talked for a few minutes about it anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so back to things that we do have answers for. So this, uh, well, we can't see on this version of PowerPoint. Uh, network externalities, everybody should use Microsoft. Hmm, okay. Okay, so there's growth. This would be 12,000, 4,000. I don't know, something else that's good. You can see the most free ones, that's nice. Does it show up on your actual computer? Uh, I don't see it. Do you want to oh, take that's that's economic freedom and life expectancy. That's life expectancy. That's so you live longer. This one I can see a little, little over 80 years in the in the most free countries. Uh, uh, around 60 years in the least free countries. So actually, if we were in a less free country, as I look around the room, a lot of you are statistically dead. Um, so this makes a big difference in terms of people's lives. I mean, it's the difference between meeting your grandchildren or getting to know your grandchildren and not. Um, Luckily, that's the last standard of living type thing I had in there. I think maybe the other one was literacy rates or something like that is higher. And basically, pick your measure, you're better off in a freer country. Um, oh, it was the income of the poorest 10%. That's what the other, other one is. So some people will say, oh, it's a trade off, though. We want a more egalitarian society, we want a bigger welfare state transferring money. Well, actually, in more free society, so when we look at measures of inequality or income inequality, excuse me, across countries, there's basically no relationship in economic freedom. More free countries, less free countries, you have just about the same dispersion of inequality. How it occurs, I think, is an important difference. In less free countries, it's those who are wealthy, are wealthy basically from the uh, welfare of the state uh, and using its power to oppress others. Whereas in more free countries, more of the people who are wealthy get their wealth by actually helping other people in the economy and innovating products. Uh, but in terms of measured inequality, it's about the same across them. However, how the poor live is drastically different. Let me be a poorest 10% in the United States rather than a middle person in one of the poorer countries in the world. I take it every day of the week, twice on Sunday. Um, or Saturday is today, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, poor do better in more free systems as well. Uh, so this is actually, and it's relative to the dynamic that you think about here too. So people who are like, oh, we have to do more transfers to the poor and it's gonna, sure it's gonna decrease our freedom but it'll make them better off. Well, in a static sense it might, but if that changes you from a 4% growth country to a 2% growth country, wait 20 years later and the poor people would have all been better off if they had been in the more free country and having incomes go up even though in the short run they were worse off. Um, all right, yeah. This definition of poor, how is that done? Is that on an absolute thing, or is that the bottom 10 percent, or is that how, how is when, when you use poor, what do you mean? Yeah, so that's important. So in this graph, the way it was done is the poor is 10 percent of any given country. Okay. Uh, I do think it's important to define, in fact, the first article I ever published was called A Poor Accounting of the Poor. Uh, and it was studying the poor in the United States. And when you define the poverty line as such that it keeps moving, now this, everyone's walking around with cell phones and flat screen TVs and they're measured in poverty. Uh, there's something wrong about this. Uh, it's also the case, by the way, when it comes to like measuring poor, and you'll see these statistics in the paper all the time. Oh, you know, the poverty rate has gone up to 13% or whatever. So one, yes, they're measuring it wrong in terms of uh, continuing to raise the standard. But there's this picture of like perpetually impoverished, of the people who are in poverty 10 years ago are the same ones who are in this 10% now. And it's absolutely not the case. So there's great data from the University of Michigan uh, it's, uh, on income dynamics. And it's looking at tracking people who were in the bottom fifth at one point 
where are they 10 years later, where are they 20 years later, and what you find is the vast majority of them 10 years later are out of the bottom fifth and into one of the other groups. Some of them even get all the way into the top fifth. Meanwhile, the top fifth, what actually what happens to most of them after 20 years is they're dead, uh, because it's people who are later in their life who are at higher incomes. It's basically life cycle, so you see lots of young people who are in the bottom fifth temporarily, or people who drop into it in any given year because they lost their job and then they get reemployed and they move out of it. Um, when you break it down to how many people are actually that perpetually impoverished one, it's a very small segment of it, um, which is another problem with measurement that that doesn't get to. But yet, for this, it was just bottom 10% of society. I'd rather be in the bottom 10% of the United States than the 50 percentile in pick your Asian country, basically, other than Japan. Uh, uh, so this is freedom across countries, and I apologize that these slides aren't working in that. Um, Misconception, most people tend to think of the United States as being the, you know, the bastion of free markets in the world. Uh, it's not, well, most people not in this room maybe. Uh, it's not, it also never has been, at least as long as we've been measuring economic freedom across countries. Uh, so this movement to measure kind of broad economic freedom across countries started in the mid-90s, but they do the uh, dating back to the 1970s far. Uh, ever since the index was created, Hong Kong has been the freest economy in the world. For most of that time, Singapore has been the second freest, and the United States has been the third. Occasionally it bumps up to number two, but it's usually been the third. But of that, it's also the largest free economy, because the other two, you know, are basically city-states that you're talking about. Uh, it's been the leader of that up through 2000. In fact, in 2000 it was ranked second, just slightly ahead of Singapore. What we've seen happen over the last decade is a dramatic decline in economic freedom in the United States. So in our relative position and in our absolute economic freedom ranking. So it's one thing, by the way, to be at the top of the index, but I think of this as like being the tallest dwarf, because uh, none of these places are truly free in what my conception of free would be. It's a, a 10 on this index to me doesn't maximize freedom. Uh, but relative to the peers around the world, these are the relatively best ones. The United States went from uh, being second in 2000 down to 18th today. In fact, that's actually lagging behind where it's really fallen because these indexes, this is the current index, but it's updated as data becomes available, which is on a two-year lag. Most of, two-thirds of the decline in economic freedom in the United States happened under Bush's presidency, not Obama's. Much of what Obama's done, the precedent was laid for by Bush. It's just Obama's been doing it faster and harder. Uh, so the rate of decline has doubled under Obama, but two-thirds of the actual decline occurred during the Bush years. Now, based off a two-year lag, though, this means if that rate of decline continued, the United States has fallen a lot farther than 18th. In fact, if that rate of decline remained the same, I think it would put us at 38th or 41st, something like that in the world now, behind you know such places as Panama. Uh, even still, though, where it is now, there's, con there's countries on every continent that rank ahead of the United States in economic freedom. There's Middle Eastern countries that rank ahead of the United States in economic freedom. The f decline has been dramatic here. Uh, Incidentally, by the way, I don't think the rate of decline has continued as rapidly the last two years as it did the first two years under Obama, because what you were seeing the first two years under the Obama is really the continuation of the bailouts and interventions related to the financial crisis. Some of that, of course, persists, but the amount of new stuff on top of that compared to the rate we had before, I think, is relatively modest. Uh, I'm going to try to get your PowerPoint fixed. Hey, we have time. Um, we had to start a little bit early, okay. just in case. And uh, we, I do have Adele over here if we need to use that PC, that way that it's probably we can not always bring those back. We can bring those graphs back. Okay. It's probably not a big deal though, because I don't, the rest of the things don't have numerical graphs too much. Oh. But, Carl. Can I ask you another question? Sure. <laughs> a correlation between civil liberties and economic uh, freedom. Um, is it important that those are positively correlated, or, or are they? Or, um, and I mean, many libertarians believe that if we, uh, if we, uh, civil liberties will follow economic liberties. Is there any reason to believe that? So it's not clear which follows which, but there was a good paper just uh, a couple years ago by a friend of mine. It was called Testing the, Free the Hayek Friedman Hypothesis. And actually, I made him change the title because he called it the Friedman Hypothesis. I'm like, Hayek had it 10 years first. Uh, but he still left Milton Friedman's name on it. But because uh, it's out of road to serfdom and the relationship between uh, 
political freedoms and so this wasn't civil so this was polity four score uh, which is your democratic freedoms basically so it's a little bit different than what you're asking but basically grouping countries as free and unfree on the two indexes and then put it into four quadrants and what you get is unfree unfree and free free are stable but when you track people in the off diagonals they tend to gravitate and move one way or the other so having a place that's economically free but not politically free tends to be unstable either it becomes more politically free or less economically free um, Ditto on the other diagonal as well. So you have this sort of high stable. Yeah, yeah, you're stable on either of the, the free, free, unfree, unfree, but the off diagonals, uh, you tend to get movement. Um, but it's not absolute. There are places in, you know, like Singapore where you're not going to have democratic freedoms and haven't for years, but you remain very high in economic freedoms. And, and talk a little about the difference between political freedoms and civil liberties. Um, <laughs> Like I, like I have a sense that our civil liberties in this country are going to hell in a handbasket where I'm not sure about whether our political freedoms have changed dramatically. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so the political freedoms are going to be accountability of government, how democratic versus autocratic it is. Uh, participation in the political process. It probably will have free speech in there as part of it, uh, as they measure. I'm trying to think of how that index is constructed, but that should be it. What it wouldn't have in there is other sort of civil liberties that don't directly translate into politics. So things like you're worried about, you know, your Fourth Amendment rights or something like that uh, wouldn't fall into that. That one, it would be strictly in civil. And there are measures of civil uh, liberties. I just don't know its relationship as well with the economic ones, uh, but that would be interesting stuff to play around with. Um, and I do think that you know, in the United States, it's been a decline of both our economic and our civil freedoms over the last decade. Uh, just I know more about the economic ones. So no luck with the PowerPoint, huh? <laughs> we were going to try to uh, dim the lights a little bit because he said it's showing up over here, but it's just the um, the grade of the font, the color. All right, that's, I know these well enough to probably tell you what these things are. So this is the decline. Oh yeah, you can see some of this stuff. He went to go try to find somebody to help us dim the lights that way that we could see it. Oh. That's better. That's better. That's better. Yeah. Yeah. Did that work? Yeah. Yeah. Now you can't see me, so everybody's happier. <laughs> All right, so this is actually looking at breaking down how our freedoms have declined in the United States. It's, um, it's almost across the board, and the exception is a rather ironic one. Uh, you can probably turn on that last one. Yeah. Uh, so this here is the five different areas of economic freedom. This here is 2000, so you can see where inflection points tend to be a little bit later in this one. Here is 2010. Uh, this is size of government. So government spending out of control in the United States are declining in economic freedom in that. Uh, this is, and this is important, this is your legal structure and property rights. Dramatic decline. So of all of these things that I think about in terms of probably their overall most importance, legal structure and property rights is kind of your underpinning of a market economy. That's where we've seen the biggest decline in the United States. Uh, this is mostly survey evidence from business people and others of how secure you think your contracts are and your property rights, but I think it's not too hard to think about the different ways that this has changed over the last 10 years of what's manifesting itself. So part of it surely is like kilo and eminent domain. Part of it is probably the increased drug war in the United States. But I also think then a big part of it is all the bailouts that started going on in 2008 where you're just rewriting people's contracts against their will. That's gotta be a big chunk of this. Uh, so major decline in that. Uh, regulation continues to grow and our freedoms there are declining. Uh, freedom to trade internationally is also down a little bit. Uh, ironically, the only one of these that hasn't declined is stable money. Um, I say ironically because we've gone through QE whatever now <laughs> and the Fed keeps printing more money, but we don't see it as measured by this index as decreasing our freedom. The reason why is because this basically measures inflation. Inflation and ability to get into other currencies. You can still convert to other currencies, no different than you could before really. And uh, measured inflation hasn't kicked up. So a lot of this has gone in, the money creation has just become excess reserve at banks. And it's no like mystery why the Fed started paying interest on excess reserves so they can create more money, the bankers can keep it in the vault and get interest off of it where they couldn't before. Yeah. Finances and, and, 
guns and wars like that? I'm sorry, dictatorship banks? Uh -huh. You mean in the United States? Yes, but uh, maybe not here locally, but maybe um, uh, foundations in other states here in the United States. That's, that's what I mean, right? Because I found out since I'm, I've been helping in, in my district, because um, it's, it's way down. And um, we have um, unemployment, and we have, um, I've been doing a lot of research, deserve research, um, on, my, on, the, on, the, on our community here locally. And I've been helping uh, Mr. Victor Hernandez, that's his district, on crime prevention. Mm -hmm. Because we're trying to build a foundation on how on sales marketing, and we have to start through sales marketing because of the um, um, the tenants, you know, the economy and the growth of population in this district, district one, where there's um, poverty and there's been looting, mm -hmm. you know, they they've been left without um, money, homeless, and all that, and. Um, they, so far, we've been work, I have been helping, you know, um, break, break up whatever disability or mentality they've been having to where there is no prosperity or growth or something. I've been, and there's, there is progress happening, but that's why I was wondering if, because I come from the, from the 60s where um, there must have been, my, our parents either got you know, you're again into dictatorship with these cult leaders coming in and taking over and trying to win citizens over to them. So, and I come from that era, but uh, it took me time to break out of it. That's why I was wondering if, because I noticed that they don't, some of these companies, you know, or enterprise corporations, some of them don't want to use banks here in Texas. You know, and why are they, why do they want to go so far to New York? You know, like loan companies and and other um, and um, you know, stores like an example is is Walmart. But like I said, I don't like to um, say it's them, but it's an example. Big enterprises like that. Yeah, so okay, so there's a lot of things there that you just gave me. Um, I don't I, people using banks anywhere around the country doesn't phase me at all, and that's part of economic freedoms, being able to choose where to it. I think there's certainly economies of scale for some businesses in dealing with big banks in other parts of the country. I think the problem is when we have a, a system where heads you win, tails taxpayer loses, where big national banks have an implicit guarantee from the government that they're going to get bailed out. Uh, I think that's a, a losing system and it encourages excessive risk taking that wouldn't occur in a private marketplace. So. I think we need to be opposed to that type of intervention and regulation, but in terms of just companies using different banks around the country, I think that's perfectly compatible with economic freedom and long-run prosperity. In terms of particular poverty problems and unemployment that persists in the United States, I think a big reason that we, our recovery from this recession is as slow as it is, is basically they destabilize the business environment. So in terms of like the recession, basically everybody, almost everybody agrees that we had a bubble beforehand. A lot of people believe it was excess monetary creation that got you the bubble. But either way, the bubble manifested itself in the housing market, so housing, construction, related industries all overexpanded. What this tells us as like a microeconomist looking at is people are doing the wrong jobs in the wrong places. So to go forward, we have to liquidate bad investments, reallocate labor and capital to other lines of work, and then you can go forward. But you have to have this reallocation. So that's painful, but like the good news is we don't have to like go around and blow up the houses or shoot the people. They're still there, we just need to reallocate what they're doing. But for that to happen, businesses have to be confident to reinvest in new lines of business. And I think what we've seen in all of the different bailouts and interventions and fiscal stimulus is basically trying to one, maintain the existing structure of industry, and two, making businesses uh, have what we call regime uncertainty, where they're uncertain what the policy environment's gonna be that they operate in. So they keep themselves on the sidelines and they don't re-employ workers who would be willing to work if only they could. Then you have other issues. So, you know, like in talk, talking about younger people in particular uh, is, uh, you know, like the high minimum wage and looking at increasing, it's one thing that keeps them unemployed when they'd rather work. But uh, in general, I think the problem with correction has been that the government has tried to prevent the correction from occurring and it's destabilized the business environment in the process of it, yeah. Can I ask you, back up just a second, in describing the reason for the 
What was it you linked with in the domain? Oh, the Kelo decision, the Supreme Court's decision in Kelo to allow eminent domain for private uh, commercial development, essentially. And it's something that we continue to see going on now. It's not just like that that was an outlier case. I mean, the big thing that's in the news now that, I mean, some people in Texas probably care about is the Keystone Pipeline, right? And most people who are kind of market inclined are like, yeah, we should be able to have the Keystone Pipeline. But part of the baggage with that is they're using eminent domain to steal people's lands in order to put it in. And if you're a consistent advocate of liberty or markets, you have to be opposed to that even though you'd support the oil company's right to bring a pipeline through. Um, so it's something that's systematic. Um, I think eminent domain is a truly evil institution we have in our society. I don't think there's a place for it for private development, but I don't think there's a place for it for roads either. If the road's worth building, you should be able to do it with private contracts. I mean, if Disney World can establish 40 square miles of Disney without ever using eminent domain, but by using holding companies and structuring its contracts correctly, it seems to me that's the right way to go about things. Because ultimately, someone who has attachment to their particular property or piece of land, you don't give them just, quote, just compensation, right, as the government takes it, then they give you fair market value. But by the very fact that your house wasn't for sale, demonstrates that you value it more than fair market value, so that cannot be just compensation, by definition. But then it means what is just compensation, and I can't think of what it would be except whatever it would take to get that person to voluntarily give up their house. Uh, so I think the whole thing needs to go, but particularly for a private involvement. Um, anyway, so basically what we see here is across the board, what area of economic freedom you look at except for money, a decline, and the money is just on a delay. So unless they're able to take these funds out of the economy before they circulate, you'll eventually see higher rates of inflation in the United States. Although I'm not someone who is a like, big inflationist predictor, so some people think the coming crisis in the United States, the government will inflate their way out of it. I suspect that won't be the case. Uh, modern economies have a hard time, governments in modern economies have a hard time inflating their way out of debt problems because so much of the debt is in three-month securities and some of it's inflation indexed anyway so that they can't get away with it the way they used to. You know, tin pot dictatorships can and then you get a Zimbabwe. Uh, yeah? Uh, when you talk about inflation, how do you define that briefly? I'm just doing it here as consumer price index, change in your cost of living. So I know some narrower definitions of inflation will just look at m money creation itself and call it that, but I'm just talking about price changes uh, in the general price level. So, across the board decline, except for money, I suspect the money one's there to come unless they can take the liquidity out of the system. Uh, a lot of it also sits overseas. Not all doom and gloom though. So here in Texas, we can measure this on a state level. Texas is the second freest state in the United States. Um, Delaware is actually the first. Um, of course though, you know, differences between US states are more modest than what's happening on the national level here. So while it's some cause for happiness here in Texas, we shouldn't get overwhelmed. If the rest of the country's going down, they're gonna drag us with it. Uh, I think you can say us now when I'm in Texas. <laughs> uh, another thing is the, the pending crisis. So just a, a little bit about this is, I'm probably preaching to the choir on this one here, but current government fiscal situation is completely unsustainable. So you cannot continue to run a $3 trillion budget with $2 trillion in revenue. When we've already racked up about $14 trillion in debt, we're sitting at about 100% of GDP owned in, owed in debt. The whole world economy is $60 trillion. Foreigners cannot continue to keep financing ever-increasing levels of debt from the United States. Simply can't be done. You can't squeeze the blood out of a rock. So the question's gonna be, and I, I don't do timing predictions at all, uh, but when it comes home to roost then, uh, and how that will be dealt with. So I don't think inflation is much of a cure, partly because of how quickly the three-month uh, debt of the United States turns over. If you get a high rate of inflation, you're not gonna get your way out of it like that. Um, partly also because governments have learned uh, that inflation is bad for them generally. Uh, we see, compared to the 1970s now, much more responsible behavior of most central banks, or most uh, major economy central banks around the world compared to what it used to be. They're not gonna be able to do it with taxes. Taxes, we already sit at uh, about 20% uh, uh, federal tax relative to the economy. Historically, as you go through the United States, the highest they ever got was about 26%, I think, in World War II. Uh, it tends to be a structural limit. It's actually kind of amazing. Of all the changes in the tax code, that the sh total tax share has remained relatively stable over the last 30 years. That suggests that there's something structural about that in the United States that's not going to be able to push beyond it. Beyond that, of course, if you just keep raising tax rates, eventually you get what we call the Laffer curve kicking in. As you raise rates, you actually get less revenue. 
Uh, I was doing consulting one time for a group in California. It was a chamber of commerce, and they were doing like impact fees because California they can't raise your property taxes because of the the famous ballot proposition there. Uh, but then what they do is they just charge new houses up front. So it'll be like $6,000 to put in a foundation. And they were talking about raising from $6,000 to $40,000 to put in a foundation in the city. Because what they did is they looked at what they wanted for road growth, came up with the cost of that, then divided over the number of houses that were built the last five years to project for the next five years. <laughs> You guys think there's a relationship between the size of the fee and how many houses are going to come in here? They're like, no, it's a desirable place. We're going to build no matter what. I'm like, okay, so let's make an impact fee. Let's work with me, guys. I'm like, if we do an impact fee of zero, how much revenue are you going to get? They're like, zero. I'm like, good. If we charge a billion dollars, how much revenue are we going to get? They're like, nobody would build. I'm like, zero. I'm like, all right, now we get the endpoints. We know it's not a straight line. It's a curve. They became really interested in finding the top of the curve, but at least it was scaling them back from going from 6,000 to like 36,000 of, of impact fees. But basically, anyway, as you continue to raise rates, you're going to have a revenue part kicking in here, and we're not going to be able to solve it for the gap that you have. So ultimately, it's going to have to come from cuts in government spending, uh, and if those are resisted, your debt problem, you're looking at a Greece type debt problem. It, uh, I'd be interested actually, in actually questions and stuff if you guys want to chat about this. But uh, I'm coming around to the position of being a fan of default and repudiation. Because um, something's got to get, right? If we look at Social Security and Medicare, what the promises are, then the current budget and then the amount of debt that's out there, something's got to give. In choosing what's give, I'm all for cutting government spending, but interest groups make it tough to do. But what about repudiating the debt? Economically, in the short run, it would be a disaster. The financial system will go into a huge crisis. In the longer run, though, it could be beneficial. If you want a credible commitment that the government's not going to have unsustainable finances in the past, make its creditors unwilling to lend to it the way they have in the past. That seems to be like a more credible balanced budget amendment than actually passing a balanced budget amendment. And for that matter, morally, by the way, if I'm thinking of like, like claims of ownership, I'm all for ending the social security system, but it would seem to me, in claims of titles at least, people who have had money taken out of their paycheck throughout their lives, against their will, potentially, are more entitled to get that money back than someone who voluntarily lent the government money. And for that matter, if you're, and this isn't particularly mine, but if your welfare metric is the welfare of US people counts more, there's a lot of foreigners that are holding US debt to heck with them. Now the problem, of course, is if like China decides to nuke you over it, then then this calculation goes out the window. But otherwise... Uh, Someone just nationalized the debt. And I mean, like, Chile did that under Allende to, uh, to the United States. I mean, most of the copper mills and our copper mines and stuff became Chilean. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I guess if we just repudiate the debt, then uh, the Chinese made a bad risk, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as they don't nuke us, we're fine. Yeah. Except we had the chance to do that when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac went down the tubes and we guaranteed them because the Chinese were holding them. Mm -hmm. And we should have done it then. If the opportunity was there. They'd been buying Fannie and Freddie securities. And then we went ahead and said, oh, a U.S. taxpayer can guarantee them. Yeah, I was, actually, I was at a conference, it was the Mont Pelerin Society meetings, and we were in Tokyo at the time it happened, and Bush's uh, chief economic advisor was there, and he held a special session right after they did the Fannie and Freddie bailout. And we were all, because it's a free market, well, mostly free market society of people, we were all over this guy in the, in the question period. He said, I don't know what you're all upset about. He said, for years, Fannie and Freddie securities have priced under what their risk is, so the market already knew we were going to do this. And so yeah. for years you said you would not do this. If there was one time to make it credible, you could have just bought your credibility instead. Oh, well, we didn't, he said, we didn't do anything. Like, we did do something. <laughs> the market was basically betting on you guys. To do it. So I think, I think this is a good point. So the question is the political will. But right. there's going to be a difference in this time in that something has to give. There was the option to still give government spending at that Fannie Freddie moment. When this moment comes, it's going to either be massive, massive reductions in government spending that are going to get other interest groups riled up. Repudiation of debt, where the debt value is going to, see the dynamic's going to happen fast in this, right? Is as you're turning this three-month T-bills over, when people start to price risk into this, the interest rate goes up. As the interest rate goes up, it becomes more unsustainable because the debt burden gets bigger. So you're going to get like an escalation point. So they're not going to have the kind of luxury that they have in other moments. So this is going to put us in one of those so we're only at 100% bet to GDP. The U.S. can probably go bigger than a lot of other countries just because of our size and position. 
But in general, once you're over the 100% debt to GDP level, this is the area that people start worrying about crises. And that's where you've got your big reformers of India, New Zealand, Ireland in the past, where they were able to do it with government spending cuts, which I'm all for. I just am well, skeptical. We're only at 100% if you ignore Social Security and Medicare and their deferred liabilities and right. all these things because the lousy government account. Yep, agreed. We're probably five or six times GDP if we really uh, take it all into account. Yeah, then the question is whether you believe those things will actually be paid or not. Um, my suspicion is they won't. Mm -hmm. In fact, actually, this is a question I do with my classes usually is I'll ask them, how many, I'm just curious, how many of you expect to receive Social Security when you're older? 10% of them do. Uh, basically, nobody, they just view it as money's being taken out of their paycheck right now like another tax. Um, so, I, uh, so they, they see their current grandparents having problems, and so the fact that their grandparents, this generation, is having problems, so they're like, well, it's going to be even worse mm -hmm. before I get to that generation. Yeah. Now, when, okay. s when speaking on repudiating debt, is that the same as Iceland? Did Iceland do the same thing, deal with their banking crisis? Because I know they, they did something along those lines, and they rebounded quite quickly from what I understand. I didn't know if Iceland was doing the same thing that you were discussing. I don't know enough about Iceland to comment intelligently on it. It was 10 years ago that I was there, and that was when they were still in their boom. Um, I haven't paid the close enough attention recently. It's it might be a good example, though. Yeah? Is this just the fact that the public doesn't understand a great deal about economics, or is it, how is it tolerable for conservatives to regularly, regularly and readily run the default on obligations? I can't believe what I hear anymore in conservative groups about talking about default. When well, we've proven to the world that we can actually economically expand ourselves out of this indebtedness through oil and gas reserves that we really gave any credibility to four or five years ago, yet we're getting there every day. Mm -hmm. And the price, you know, uh, if we stall out this economy by actually defaulting on a lot of these deals, a lot of those reserves, you know, that right now are economic won't. Because just like you said, we'll have such a contraction in the economy that we will go into a major necessary. Mm -hmm. So a contraction though, a contraction that's short lived and you reallocate resources is just reshuffling things so you can move forward. The problem is the, so the last one we had didn't do that at all. Right. Our indebtedness. It's a result of the interventions and in response. Right. We, we have coming out of any. Yeah, so that's actually important related to the decline in economic freedom in the United States. This, what we're seeing in terms of economic growth now. So when I think of like macroeconomics, to me it's all about what the long-term trend line is. Business cycles are deviations in that trend line and I don't think, I think economists have spent a disproportionate amount of time on. However, what happens is if in that recession your policy response to it undermines your institutions, so you lose your long-term trend line, that's what I think we've seen happen in this last crisis here. Measured in this decline in economic freedom, instead of expecting long-term growth rates of 3%, it cuts it down to about 1.2%. So that's your new equilibrium you're returning to. So part of the slow recovery is still recession recovery. Part of it is the new reality of what the long run is gonna look like in the United States, conditional on having bad institutions. Now, I do agree with you that we don't have to go to a crisis. I think in the United States, if we reform towards economic freedoms here now, cut government spending by 30% and ceased doing all of these interventions, you would get yourself out of a lot of this problem with economic growth. First of all, your budget deficit would disappear, so now you're just worried about your Social Security, Medicare stuff. Your impending crisis, while it's still there, is kicked down the road a bit and there's a lot of economic growth and tweaks on the margin you can do to deal with it. What I don't believe will happen, though, is that any party, Republican or Democrat, is gonna seriously address Washington's spending problem in absence of a crisis. I think it's going to take a crisis in order to get them to do it. Uh, so this is why, particularly the last 10 years, it's the big government Bush era of the expansion of government spending and then big government Obama just piling on top of that. But every crisis we've had, as a matter of fact, the people that grow up the most are notorious for saying, don't let us squander the big crisis. Right. So right. There's, a, there's a book called Crisis and Leviathan by a guy, Robert Higgs, and that's his study of the growth of government in the United States is in response to most crises, the government grows here. But that's not a theoretical guarantee. It doesn't have to happen that way. And when we look around the world, most cases of pro-market reform are preceded by crises. So crises just break a political equilibrium. They don't tell you which direction you move in afterwards. A lot of that depends on what ideas are on the table 
and how you push them on policymakers. So what I think is crucial is that we have the right free market ideas circulating among the general populace who can force it on the politicians when the moment comes. Uh, if the wrong ideas are on the table, you're going to get worse interventions and put yourself in a worse situation. Has one of the speakers y'all bringing in Allison addressed this? Uh, so, <laughs> unfortunately, John Allison won't be coming here in the fall. He was planning on it. I just got an email from him last week. So I'm trying to get him rescheduled for the spring. Uh, but yeah, he's got a good book on the financial crisis and what he calls the free market cure. Um, I'll get to just a sec what we got for programming coming up. Yeah. I think one of the most interesting things about Dr. Hayes' thesis is that the government grows in scale and scope. Mm. Um, and I think that kind of ties into one of your points earlier about um, kind of the tenuousness of, of our legal and property rights. So it's, I think, you know, as, as these crises come and go, you know, government itself grows in its, in its scale, right? When you're spending more money building all these companies out, but then also the scope is kind of the part that we don't really see you know, on the surface, and then it kind of comes up later on in the long run. Yeah, uh, I mean, we certainly feel it. It's just not measured usually right. the same, yeah. Uh, so let me just finish up kind of quickly here then with the introduction to Free Market Institute, what we're doing, and then we can just have general, we can turn the lights back on and uh, have general discussion. Uh, so just uh, briefly then, so we've got the Free Market Institute here started at Texas Tech. Uh, a couple of faculty members at the University, Eduardo Seguera and Mike Giberson are already associated with it. I introduced Chuck earlier who's working with us. Uh, we're hiring two more faculty members to join us uh, next year, so they'll arrive in fall of 14. Uh, looks like we're just securing new space for the Institute now. It'll be over in the Bank of America building right on the corner of uh, <laughs> University and 19th. Um, and we've got early works in for a new grant that'll bring a few more faculty members in there too. So we hope to have six to 10 faculty members or so a few years down the line from here. Uh, type of things that we're gonna be working on. Uh, so obviously teaching undergrads and PhD students. In fact, I'm actually teaching a course next year in uh, Austrian economics. Uh, never had that opportunity at a university before. And it wasn't even my idea, it was Texas Tech's idea. They said, would you mind teaching a course on Austrian economics? I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but we've, we're doing various things, so research projects, so I've mentioned the causes of economic freedom. Uh, we'll have a new seminar series that gets kicked up, a research seminar series, mostly for uh, graduate students and faculty. Uh, that'll be every other Friday next fall. Bringing in visiting professors, uh, hopefully endowing some chairs and professorships to be associated with the Institute. For your all's purposes, outreach is probably what's most, most relevant. Uh, we have a regular lecture series that's open to the public. Uh, that'll be about three lectures per semester where we bring in noted free market economists from around the country, around the world to give public lectures. Uh, maybe some of which, if the dates work, could be shared with your group here if you wanted them on a Saturday, but uh, more than likely at a minimum at least inviting you all to participate and, and show up to that. Uh, we do outreach to the media too. Um, on the radio shows fairly frequently here in town already and sometimes out to the, the local newspaper as well. Uh, we do have a website up now, so if you all want to check it out, uh, FMI, Free Market Institute, fmi.ttu.edu. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook now, and if you like us on Facebook or whatever, however that works, Chuck set it up so that you'll see when we're running public events and have other news updates and stuff like that coming out. Um, but otherwise, the website has most of that. What we've got coming up for, for seminars next fall, so the first one's gonna be a big one. Uh, Walter Williams, who I'm sure most of this crowd knows, uh, who's syndicated in the local Monday paper here. He actually was the chairman of the economics department where I did my graduate work. Uh, so I contacted him and asked him to come out. He'll be giving a lecture for us on September 18th. Uh, it'll be in the Allen Theater on campus. Uh, Chuck, did we set the time on it? What? September 19th. Sorry, it's Thursday. Uh, this is why I bring Chuck with me. <laughs> Do we have? If we set a time for it, it's five or five thirty, right? We haven't set that yet. All right, five or five thirty. Uh, Williams will be lecturing on something related to liberty and free markets of his choosing. Uh, he's a bit tough to get to town, actually. Uh, when I asked him, he wrote me back. He told me his fee, which is enormous. Uh, then he's like, and you might know, I've grown tired of the TSA, so I no longer fly commercial. Uh, so, yeah. Good that he can get away with that and still get speaking invites if I said such a thing. I would never leave town. Uh, uh, anyway, so he'll be here. And we're hoping to have a lot of people out to it. Uh, he gives a great lecture. You never know quite what you're going to get with Williams. Uh, are you recording this? Yeah. Um, so I'm looking forward to a good, good lecture. Uh, yeah, or I can talk later. Uh, other things coming up uh, also that semester, October 17th is set. We've got a nice, uh, great young economist from West Virginia University, Andrew Young. Uh, he's a macro guy. Uh, he's doing a talk called It's a Small World After All, Globalization, Interconnectedness, and the Wealth of Nations. Um, he also might talk about 
crisis and business cycle a little bit because he's done a lot of research on that stuff. Uh, and November 7th, I uh, have visiting for a whole week here a guy, David Scarbeck, and his wife Emily, who's also an economist. She'll be giving a talk for us too, uh, from King's College. He's doing really interesting work on governance and prison gangs. Um, and how basically they're able to provide their own system of governance outside of the law and how they even have written constitutions and enforce it. So his talk, Prison Gangs and Governance Order in the Criminal World, at first you might be like, why is the Free Market Institute having to talk about prison gangs? Well, it's because while his research is on prison gangs, the lessons that you draw for it are actually about how do you have a, gov a self-governing society and how might you provide rules and order in absence of a state giving them to you. Uh, there's a lot wider lessons in there. There's a famous economist, Tom Schelling, actually, uh, who just gave him a jacket quote for his book. And it, it, the jacket quote was, I hope everybody realizes that this isn't a book about prison gang. It's a, it's a, a book about how we get our own governments and governance. Uh, so that's really, uh, it, it'll seem like kind of just a fun, popular talk of he's doing prison gang stuff, but there's some underlying free market lessons there that I think are important. Kind of like one of the guys we had out earlier this semester, uh, Peter Leeson, who gave a talk on pirates and how 18th century pirates basically created their own rules and democratic checks before uh, uh, democratic governments did. Uh, so those are coming up for the fall. Spring, we're gonna have Vernon Smith out here. Uh, he's the 2002 Nobel Prize winner in economics. Uh, he's known for creating the field of experimental economics, putting people in laboratories, paying them based off their performance, so not like psychology experiments, but actually paying people according to how they uh, interact in the lab so that way there he can create the rules of the game kind of and then allow the participants to uh, exercise their own decisions and be rewarded within those rules. Uh, incidentally, he's also probably the most free market Nobel Prize winner that there has been. And that's inclusive of Frederick Hayek and Milton Friedman. It's just that in Vernon's published research and stuff, it's not always directly addressing those issues, whereas in Hayek and Friedman it was much more obvious that that's what they were working on, but at least in normal conversation with him, he's radically pro-market um, and quite an interesting deep thinker. Uh, so he'll be out in February or January, we haven't set the date yet, we just agreed that it would be early spring. Uh, so much more to come with that, I hope uh, all of you can come to some of our talks and such and uh, for now I'd be happy to have any more discussion with you all or whatever, yeah? Um, I know that they're trying at this point to possibly increase the minimum wage. What? When, years ago, when we were in school, we probably were at minimum wage or maybe even below. And we managed to actually pay rent and buy groceries and uh, go to school and have a life. Mm -hmm. Someone on minimum wage now probably can't do that because cost of living has improved with that. Do you think? Increasing the minimum wage is going to move people out of that poverty? No. I think more people will be in poverty if you increase the minimum wage. So, I agree with you. Okay. Um, so, actually, this was a call. I wrote the column for the Lubbock newspaper a couple weeks ago on the minimum wage, uh, the proposals to increase it. So, all you do with raising the minimum wage is price people out of the labor market. Particularly, youths and minorities get hardest hit by it. So we can look at the states that have higher than the federal minimum wage right now, and you have very high rates of youth unemployment. Basically, minimum wage, in terms of, when we think about it as an anti-poverty thing, it's just wrong. 98% of hourly employees make more than the minimum wage. So it's not the case. In fact, and the majority of the people who do make it are part-timers. So it's not like the head of household breadwinner whose full-time job is minimum wage for the vast majority of the people affected. Mostly what it does is it prices young people out of the job market for their first job so they don't build the skills to get higher wages later. I think it's, uh, now I will say that a lot of attention is focused on minimum wage often with conservative groups versus democratic groups on this. And I think it's all largely symbolic because all politicians understand that they can't raise them, excuse me, Almost all politicians, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren excluded, uh, realize that they can't just willy-nilly raise the minimum wage by great amounts because otherwise they'll unemploy everybody. Uh, so that no one advocates a hundred dollar an hour minimum wage because uh, they realize nobody will have jobs virtually. But where they always advocate tweaking it is within the margin where very few people are affected by it, so you get very small unemployment effects. So it's largely a symbolic gesture that doesn't really do a great deal. Uh, except for those targeted groups, basically youths and particularly minority youths that get hit by it, who aren't really a very good voting block anyway. Um, well, it's not like there should be, 
employer is I want to hire a kid for $5 an hour or $3 an hour or whatever it is to do a menial task. Mm -hmm. It would make sense because they learn some skills at they're basically getting paid to show up. Mm -hmm. But to sweep the floor or do whatever they need to do, they should be able to pay a small amount to get that job done. Yeah, and we can't underestimate it. What you said, pay to show up, is important because just in terms of futuring, uh, signaling to your future employers, you have to be able to show that you're someone they want to hire. What's a good way to do that? Well, you've held down a job for three years. Yes, it was at a low wage, but that at least means that you are showing up and doing your work. Now, if they think you can do a better job, you've signaled that you're capable of meeting that minimum to start with. I and mean, actually, that's a large part of college degrees too, right? A lot of people get their college degree not to go on and do anything with their degree, but to just signal that they were capable of going to college for four years and showing up without being trashed every day and getting a diploma at the end of it. So you're the type of person that we want to hire. Uh, and the minimum wage gets some people to start like that who aren't going to get that college degree and go in that market if they could work for below it. Incidentally, by the way, there has been a disaster of a, a minimum wage in the United States. The very first one came in in the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act in 1937, and it set it at 25 cents an hour at the time average productivity in the United States I think was 62 and a half cents an hour. Uh, so this is 37 where you get your second recession within the Great Depression. So it did have an effect here, but they were sloppy when they wrote the law. It applied to the United States and all of its territories. At the time, average productivity in Puerto Rico was about four cents an hour. Put in a 25 cent minimum wage, mass unemployment and business closure immediately. Uh, so, they had, so that's the equivalent of doing the $100 an hour minimum wage now is what they did then. Yeah. I agree completely. I suspect that no politician cares. Uh, <laughs> although, although I, actually, though. Uh, hey, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just going to say something about addressing the the poverty levels, where you know, people that are passionate about helping the poor people, and you know, something that she was talking about earlier. It's like we've got these problems. And they're very real problems. And, um, you know, I don't think that they understand, that there's a lot of people that understand the full spectrum of what the problem really is and where the problems lie. And I think that they think that it's just if we can throw money at it, if we mm -hmm. can just, just increase, you know, economic stimulate the, the poverty level, the welfare system, that that's going to fix our problem, but it's just perpetuating the problem. And so I think with this, uh, something that Tom Woods brought up at the uh, the event that y'all were sponsoring mm -hmm. at the Catholic Church, um, you know, he said that it's the lifestyles that we've set for ourselves. So it's basically like when I look at the poverty level now and po people in poverty, it doesn't look like poverty really, in it, like historically. And I think that our expectations um, to get them to where they where they're out of poverty is unrealistic. Like I think that, that to maintain the same lifestyles that we've been living, mm -hmm. um, we have to lower our standards. We have to go back and limit ourselves and say that we're just gonna you know, take the minimal, be minimalists. And that I can live off the land, I can grow something, you know, I can just grow for just my family. Um, it, looking at those alternatives rather than saying, I've got to have this cell phone, I've got to have this, and almost like it's it's like it has to be this change within our society and our systems within the cities. Yeah. So I so I agree that until people in the United States who talk about the poverty problem in the United States have gone to poorer countries in the world, they really haven't seen poverty. Um, it's orders of magnitudes difference. And when you're talking about your kid starving or not starving, we have obesity problems in the United States, and they say poor people don't eat the right food. Um, that said, I think there are you know. Instead of focusing on their standard of living and whether they can have a cell phone or not, we could think about barriers to human fulfillment and what are the things that get in their way of self-actualizing the type of life they want to lead. And there, I think we have lots of government interventions that are either through having poor public schooling uh, that waste a lot of their time, having a drug war that destroys their communities. Uh, I think these things create real barriers to human flourishing that we should be concerned about, and there is a poverty in that. It's just not in their, their material lifestyle. Yeah. I'm close over to massive social unrest. I mean, because in some sense, in some sense, the ammunition's really all gone from the stores. <laughs> it doesn't matter what absolute poverty is. If people are out in the streets protesting, burning things up because they don't have cell phones, it, does, it doesn't matter whether it makes any sense. 
Yeah, no, I, so I don't know about the social unrest question. <laughs> it's a, it's a, but the ammo is hard to get right now, though. That's Because I've, I've been confused about this. Why is the ammo so hard to get right now? Because like, during all the assault weapon ban stuff that they were talking about, no one was talking about taking away ammo, so there shouldn't have been a shortage then, which means it's a leading signal of something else. Uh, yes? Yeah, I just learned about that when I came in here. I told Ray he's going to get to go see real guns afterwards. <laughs> I'm sorry. Would the Europeans be a better off today if they had kicked the Greeks out of the Eurozone like three years ago when it's obvious they weren't going to get their budget problem solved? Probably, yes. Well, yeah. Is it a problem of moral hazard? That yes. Because they know they can get away with it, they still cheat. Yes. But I'm, I'm tempted to make the argument now that Europe's better off as a result because it's going to break the whole European Monetary Union, which is a better thing if the whole thing goes away. Uh, I think the EU has been good for select countries in Eastern Europe who needed marginal pushes towards markets. It's been good for that. It's been bad for some. I was upset when Estonia joined the European Union for them. Harmonizing to EU standards meant becoming more socialistic mm -hmm. because they were like the star of Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, for Western European countries, I think it promotes collusion among their their, their political institutions and leads to less freedom. So I'll be happy to see the whole thing break down. So maybe Greece being in there and everybody cheating is a good thing. Um, once France has the problem is when they when they really go down. Yes. I often hear uh, politicians talking about uh, the need to narrow the gap between the very wealthy and the very poor. The income disparity as being something that's bad somehow. But I've never really heard them offer moral argument as to uh, what salutary benefits might be coming from income disparity. Mm -hmm. uh, income disparity does not seem to me to be inherently wrong or morally reprehensible. But politicians always speak of it in that way, never justifying that kind of perspective. Would you address income disparity and reality and Sure. So I gr agree completely that if we have heterogeneous people in this world, which we obviously do, giving each the freedom to flourish on their own is going to result in different outcomes across all margins. Income is one of them. So why we should have a fetishism about trying to equalize that margin I think is bizarre. I think a moral world would see people with lots of differences. Now the key would be addressing, so like the Occupy Wall Street movement, as much as I hated like the unbathed people who were part of that, the valid point they did have is for some of the wealthy who get their money by basically getting the government to guarantee their banks and whatever, that's an income inequality that is unjustified and we should oppose. But to the extent that they do it by creating wealth for others in private markets, it's a good thing. And it encourages other people then to go ahead and innovate and do things like that too. It's also the case, by the way, that inequality, especially as measured by income, is just way overblown in my mind. So you can measure these things and they'll talk about the rising inequality and the spread, well, okay, so let's take Bill Gates, right? So richest man, I don't know what factor it is, uh, some, some number of million times wealthier he is than I am. Billion times, How, some billion number of times. <laughs> Whatever it is, let's make it billion. <laughs> He's not gonna live that same multiple billion longer than me. He might get better health care. he might live a little bit longer than me. If he's gonna travel to Europe, he doesn't travel there a billion times faster than me. He does it on a nicer private jet, but it's not a billion times more comfortable than a normal aircraft. And as you go, like, as, as you experience life across all these margins, experienced inequality is much less than measured income inequality because you can't buy all of these other margins to, the, to that same extent. Uh, so I think it's really kind of overblown. Um, it's also the case, by the way, when they address it with policy, of like, well, income inequality, even if people live well, makes them feel bad. My perception of people is there's very few people who feel bad because of Bill Gates' wealth or because of some stranger's wealth. The kind of jealousy component of it is very localized. It's like the brother-in-law who has the nicer car. Uh, but it's not like this measured policy variable type thing. So I think it's completely overblown. To some extent, it's the difference of you think of Bill Gates, well, at least he produced something that we all use. So Almost everybody. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, that's a legitimate uh, problem. 
Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. Yes, you've been. Uh, I tend to put everything back into local terms because that's where I work all the time as a taxpayer advocate. And uh, I have an you're touching uh, plants on the crony capitalism, and we do it here in the name of stimulating economic development, and yet the only people who benefit from it are the uh, good old boys and the administrator uh, here of the LEADA group, the Public Economic Development Association makes $250,000 a year, and several make over 100000 in that, and yet the sales tax and property tax we repeal by 84 percent to keep funding it and uh, it's uh, that's where I see a lot of the inequities and on a lot of the sales tax elections a lot of the people that supported my position of capturing as much of that as possible for property tax reduction instead of going into that uh, were uh, you know lower income folks who saw it as a regressive tax but uh, they also of course here again on the local level, find all different ways to tax where you don't have any options. And that's the hidden taxes on our utility bills that are going a franchise fee and a payment below taxes, which is a property tax, going into the general fund, and yet people have no options about paying those. And so they're impacted the most uh, in that regard, and yet the people who scream the loudest, the chamber bunch, and imagine a lot of dreamers and all of this stuff that's coming around is uh, very much for limited uh, property rights if they get in if you get their way and more increase in debt and spending and so I always see a lot of it sort of as a mirror reflection of what's going on nationally and even internationally because that's where we as a at least I as an individual can really have a lot more impact I've been fighting to get us out of the U.N. since I was five years old. It doesn't happen just because I think it should. But uh, uh, it, it's just interesting, and, and you as newcomers to love it, I, I need to sit down with you and, and read you on the history of the love it. Yeah, see, you're exactly right. Me as a newcomer on this is going to take your word for all of this. <laughs> you're sort of commenting it all. <laughs> She's the one to go to on local economic issues. All right. <laughs> Uh, I want to go back to that feel bad feeling that we were talking about and the uh, inequalities and all this. And to me, it just isn't it that feel bad feeling that someone else is doing better than I am that fuels ambition, fuels competition, fuels the free market system? And I think we need to quit listening to politicians and falling for their their pitch. Mm -hmm. on that, oh, well, you know, we need to make these people feel better, or we need to, you know, get rid of that feel bad feeling. It's, I think it's a society, it's an educational goal that we should have to instill that if you feel bad, then get up and do something about it. That's why we educate our people. I know it's, it's my family's feel bad feeling that they had to go out and pick cotton every day and freeze and you know, work in the fields that got us to where we are now. Um, it's that feel bad feeling that my brother had when he was roofing, uh, when he was going to school, and he was roofing and it was 95 degrees on that roof that made him work on his PhD. You know, it's just, it's okay to have that feel bad feeling and do something about it. It's part being free. I think, I think that's important. I think what we have to think about though is making sure that we're in the right environment because when you have that feel bad feeling in a free enterprise economy, it promotes all the right things. If you have that feeling in the former Soviet Union, that feel bad feeling promotes getting yours or taking someone else's, right? Mm -hmm. So actually there's a, a I don't are. know if I have time for a joke, a <laughs> joke about encountering people in Russia after the Soviet Union. It's like, oh, there's a, you know, a Frenchman, a Englishman, and a Russian, and they find a magic lamp, they rub it, the genie comes out and says, you have three wishes, you each get one. And the Englishman says, you know, my neighbor has a nice yacht, I would like a nice yacht, boom, he gets a nice yacht. Frenchman says, my neighbor has a nice vineyard, I would like a nice vineyard, boom, he gets a nice vineyard. The Russian says, my neighbor has a dog, I don't have a dog, kill my neighbor's dog. <laughs> 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 but that's the type of, if you're not in like the private enterprise economy, that's the type of mentality that it would promote then. So I think it's, I think you're exactly right, but we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing 
kind of nationally setting the right environment to encourage that so that we don't encourage people to just try to get theirs and put in more rigs in the system. Yes? How do you see um, in the future like for the honor of currency valuations going down versus the like nation like China you know, being the gold standard replacing our currency? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I don't do currency predictions. Uh, I mean, so I do think it is the case though that we take for granted in the United States that the dollar is there, it's going to be, we live in a very unique historical time since the early 1970s. For just about 40 years now, has been the only 40 years in world history that currencies, that the major currencies of the world have had nothing to their value except people's expectations that you'll take them for something else. It's the only time in human history it's been like this. There's no tie to any commodity. All that needs to happen is people's expectations to change and that entire system collapses. Someday that will happen. Now what replaces it, I don't know if it would be a gold standard or it's some other commodity standard. The new thing I don't really know that much about is Bitcoin. That's been a, a big craze. And apparently a lot of people in Greece have been rushing to convert things into Bitcoin and that's what's made its price go way up over the last couple months. Um, what's Bitcoin? Uh, Bitcoin is, um, I don't know if I can do it well because I'm like kind of a technological idiot. Uh, <laughs> But it's a digital currency that's created by people going through a programming exercise of some sort to create the currency, but it's costly to do it, so it's like your equivalent of going and mining your gold. Uh, and as you create more of it, it gets harder and harder to create more, so there's kind of like a limit on how much can be created. And then people trade this digitally with each other. Uh, if you look up Jeff Tucker, uh, has a, if you Google Jeff Tucker and Bitcoin, he's got a couple good introductory articles to it that are online. I think he might have wrote one for the Freeman, uh, the Foundation for Economic Educations thing. Actually, I'm sorry. I, their books just came out with a primer on Bitcoin. Okay, Jeff's, is, Jeff's the president of Laissez Faire. Um, so yeah, they, they have a whole book on it now? They just came out with it just a couple of days ago. Okay, great. So, I mean, if you sign up as LFD, uh, that kickstart work, perhaps. It's a fiat currency. Uh, a private that isn't backed by a government and supposedly has some computer uh, programming uh, advantage in that you can't make any more of it. We'll see if that you can make more, but it's hard. It gets progressively harder and harder to make more of it. It's uh, well, you're supposed to be a 21 million, a 21, yeah, 21 million or billion? Million. Million, million dollar. A $21 million Bitcoin limit at some point. In other words, it's programmed mm -hmm. to only increase up to that point unless somebody can get around that. Okay. No, it's 21 what million that? Bitcoin because you can buy them up into eight decimal places, so that, that means you can right. have a fraction of Bitcoin. That's true. Sure. Is that part of the free market system to come up with these types of currencies, like you know, encouraging different types of currencies? I mean, even in the Bitcoin realm, there's at least ten other digital currencies out there: Litecoin, Litecoin. Navicoin. There's a few others out there that are just like Bitcoin, but but then there's that challenge coming up. There are people that want to make that illegal, saying that that's not. That, that's yeah, those are governments who don't like competition. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the the market for money is different than other markets in that it's going to be part of all transactions. But what it has in common with other markets is we don't know what the market should look like until entrepreneurs compete and innovate. And when we have a world of government currencies that outlaw competition, I can guarantee you that we don't have the optimal monetary arrangements. So we need this type of competition to discover what digital currencies, what commodities. So like a lot of free market people are like, we got to go back to the gold standard. I'm like, I don't know. What we need is competition in currencies, and we'll see if the gold standard is what is chosen again or if the modern economy requires works something differently. So the Bitcoin thing is bizarre to me because Hayek's got his book in, from the 1970s on competition and currency, uh, where he's like, entrepreneurs will just create new fiat currencies that will compete. And I always said, well, how do they get their value to start with? You need some sort of regression theorem of the commodity that it was based off before you can divorce it. Bitcoin seems to be an exception like, with that that follows starting with something that has no value, mm -hmm. somehow getting valued. Um, well, it has value well, because yeah. it's People put the currency. Right. I, I guess what I mean, though, is when it started, the first person to accept a Bitcoin, why the hell would they accept it? <laughs> uh, whereas, like, when you look at all the historical currencies, right, it first started off as a commodity that was traded, and eventually its exchange value dominated its commodity. Well, they view this for smuggling and illegal activities that are banned by governments, you see, without having a record of what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know enough about Bitcoin. I'd be I, I am curious about how, 
Like I've gone into enough like libertarian and free market things. Ben, uh, <laughs> yeah. Just a personal question. You talked a lot about uh, some about Austrian and the conventions in Austrian economists. Do you fall into the category of being primarily Austrian or more monetarist or? Uh, I'm an economist uh, <laughs> who likes to do good economics. Uh, I think a lot of what Austrian economics has to offer falls into that category. I think some of it, especially done by many current practitioners, is a waste of time and doesn't fall into good economics. Uh, but I also deal with public choice economics, take insights from those guys, from new institutional economics, from property rights economics, from experimental. Uh, I don't think any of my own research contradicts strict Misesian Austrian methodology if interpreted correctly. Um, in fact, I'm just taken over as editor of the Review of Austrian Economics Scholarly Journal, um, but I don't consider myself narrowly just Austrian, um, but certainly have an appreciation for a lot of its teachings. Um. Oh, I'm sorry, you're very, you organized this and I'm ignoring <laughs> you because you're in the blind spot. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that uh, a political system is not necessarily uh, determinative of its economic system. Mm -hmm. But do you find the inverse to be a little more true? Namely that uh, if, a, if a, say, a dictatorship adopts a free market, can the market force sort of act upon the, the nature of the political system? Yes, so this would be a couple, some of those off -stage. So you're economically free but politically unfree tends to be unstable you either end up repressing the economy or becoming more democratically free. In most cases, but not always. So like Singapore persists, but like you take Chile, right? And Pinochet puts in more free market oriented reforms and eventually the dictatorship transforms to a democracy there. So it's not like a, a, a must follow argument, but it's just an instability generally. Um, but some like Singapore can persist. I guess, I guess the example I'm thinking of is, you know, there's, seems like every uh, presidential election this uh, topic of whether we should trade with uh, Cuba comes about and it just seems like to me if we give them a free market or, or open up a free market they become it seems to yeah I think the US the embargo on Cuba is one of the dumbest policies that's perpetuated for as long as it has it's obviously not promoting the type of change that was desired by US policymakers there. yeah I mean I can't say that I'm particularly interested in Cuba or ha care one I mean it just seems like obvious that we so there is increasing evidence of uh, what we call contagious capitalism yeah. so this isn't necessarily about the political institutions but countries that are more economically free when they trade with a less economically free country over time that less free country starts becoming more free um, it's not a it's statistically significant but it's not a huge magnitude of change but it is positive and if you get a poor, uh, less free country like Cuba trading with lots of free countries, that effect amplifies. Have we seen that happen with China at all? They're communist in name, right? But we have somewhat. Well, isn't yeah. North Korea doing that in the far north? They have this certain capitalist zone to where South Korean companies can come in and build their their factories, and they they practice in this semi-capitalist view. But it's only in this north section where most people can't even keep an eye on it. I just read about this recently. I didn't know that they even had something like that. But Yeah, I don't know about the North Korea part. But the China part, where their political institutions have remained communist, I think it's very easy to make the case that the Chinese have moved much more towards a free enterprise economy than the Russians have, despite nominally dropping communism in one and not in the other. Uh, yes? Would you consider, I think you're replacing Mr. Allison, with the, you know, with someone that would address America's constant temptation by both parties, the establishment of both parties, to stimulate the economy through war. Because we are right now confronting a situation that can turn into a war real literally. Every time Russia has oil prices up as close as they are to $100 and that will save the people like Syria and those other. And our leadership doesn't seem to be sensible enough to want to stay out of this. So, possibly consider that. Yeah. Well, the Keynesians say, and a lot of our people are Keynesians, they say, look, we got out of the depression of World War II. So, you know, now we're beginning to talk jingoistic about Syria. I mean, it's pretty yeah. So, uh, that's their solution. Well, that's economically successful for some people. So, they, you know, wars. 
So uh, the two parts to this, I guess, is uh, I have the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech, not the Libertarian Institute at Texas Tech. So we won't be doing events on war per se. War on the effect on the economy, I think, is certainly within that realm. Uh, I don't know about in the next academic year doing it, but I'd certainly be interested in hosting a guy like Robert Higgs who could speak to exactly that. Uh, although Higgs himself is <laughs> heading to the hinterlands of Mexico for his retirement where he says he's going to find freedom. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not joking. But his actual research though addresses what you're, the point you're raising, the Keynesians will say World War II got us out of it, is a huge myth. And actually in the economic history literature it's been largely blown up. But just common sense, if you think about people you know, how they lived during World War II versus how they lived in the Great Depression, most of them lived worse during World War II. You had rationing in terms, we could do stuff, but like making a bunch of stuff and going blowing it up doesn't itself create economic value for the people <laughs> who are there. The, the work is a bad. Work is a bad thing. We want the value created by the work, so making stuff to go blow up. And for that matter, unemployment goes away. Yeah, you had conscription. And I've never seen a slave society that has unemployment problems. If you can make people work by force of order, it goes away. So, but I think, uh, so there's a great book, it's called Depression, War, and Cold War. Uh, and that's by the guy Higgs. And he addresses this World War II myth. Um, Was he actually factoring in dead people's uh, contribution had they still lived? I don't think we, so. We didn't do that with 50 million people. Yeah, no, he makes the argument that I think 1946-47 is when you come out of the, the depression as measured by people's consumption patterns. Um, but I don't think he, I don't remember seeing something like that figured in, because I'm also not sure how he'd actually do it either. Um, but it's a valid point anyway. What was his name? Uh, Robert Higgs, and the book was Depression, War, and Cold War. I know you can get it uh, at the Independent Institute's website, independent.org. Yeah, John. You, you earlier mentioned, you earlier mentioned uh, the effect that regime uncertainty has had on why this recession has lasted so long. In that book, Dr. Hayes has a great chapter on regime uncertainty that made the Depression last as long as it did. So a lot of things that the Roosevelt administration did throughout the 1930s to make the business environment more uncertain and prevented the investments that might have taken us out of the Depression a little earlier. So to confuse about freedom or the lack of learning time, we can make a new constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Which incidentally has uh, all about um, in imminent domain, right? Mm -hmm. So would, should that be modified? Yeah, so I don't equate the Constitution with freedom in the United States, actually. Uh, there's some things that it does that preserves it, and there's some things that it does that undermines it. And actually, given my druthers, I think the move to the Constitution from the Articles of Confederation was a move towards statism, not towards freedom. I agree. Yeah. I agree, too. <laughs> all right, that's a happy note to end on, then. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. I do have some cards with me if any of you want to be able to get in contact. But uh, please look us up on Facebook and our website so you know when our events are. And I hope to see some of you at it. And appreciate you all letting me come and talk to you today. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's give uh, Dr. Powell one more uh, warm welcome. Yeah. 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 And, uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming. This was a great turnout. And, uh, you know, like I said, if, uh, if you guys want to see more of this, uh, get in touch with us, get involved. And uh, I'd like to thank my co-organizers, uh, Amanda Smith and Mallory Miller. Uh, I'd like to thank Carl Sequist for his... Uh, contribution to sort of offset some of the costs uh, related to today and um, just in, in, in the future uh, we'd like to hear more from you guys and uh, as Amanda said if you know anybody who's got uh, any expertise on a particular issue it you know may not necessarily require a PhD but if you've got some experience or uh, something you feel like would be useful for us to discuss in one of these workshops let us know and uh, like I said, we want to make this a, a monthly deal and because this was a very lively discussion and I think very productive. So, um, any more questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.